Today's guest on the Winning Teams podcast is Sophie Wade. Now, Sophie is an expert on the future of work, and we dive into the topic in some detail, and I absolutely loved this interview, and I love the message that you that, that that Sophie was sharing about so many different topics that we talk about. Talk about the great resignation. We talk about empathy in the workplace, which is the the subject of the book that that she has written, Empathy Works, which I would highly recommend, and really understand what empathy means and how it can be implemented in the workplace. We talked about, as I said, the great resignation and and how that is shaping work. Uh, for the future and also how we can navigate where you know there's multiple careers uh, in 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 a lifetime and how we actually navigate that and how organizations can also help and support the navigation of that of that challenge i also talked about the the concept of retirement or the concept of non-retirement in in sophie's words but i really found this to be a very very fascinating subject i found the book to be a great read uh, and very much a how-to read as well. So really helpful in terms of how you how you actually implement and how you make it happen. Uh, so I really encourage you to get the book. I really encourage you to listen to this podcast. If you enjoy it, please go and give us some ratings wherever you're listening to your podcasts because that's how we get to reach more people. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy the very fascinating Sophie Wade. Sophie, thank you so much indeed for joining us here on the Winning Teams podcast. It's a real honor to have you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Not at all. You're an authority on the future of work, and I want to come back and talk about that. But you've written a number of books, one of which was Embracing Progress, and the other which is the one we're going to talk about now, The the Empathy Works. But maybe just for the listeners, might just give a little bit of background to your work and what brought you to actually write and uh, and consult about these topics um well this is really my second career and it this all came about i'd always been working you know full-time jobs either been in big organizations in or very small organizations sometimes consulting for them been working around the world in five different countries and working in very different ways and then you know it came to the point where my second uh, child my daughter was three and really it was very challenging having a full-time job uh, trying to get everything done and have any time with them either in the evening or at the weekends and so I started looking to workplace flexibility and having a a, a three day a week uh, yeah three day a week job so that I could get other stuff done during the week and as I and I did that actually started working for a friend um, doing uh, executive search for for hedge funds, which was very interesting. Um, it wasn't, you know, wasn't the, the perfect job for me, but it got me doing research about f- workplace flexibility. This was in 2011. And then that developed into actually setting up my own company when I realized, first of all, I sort of thought it was a, a women's issue. And then I realized it was a, just a, a workplace issue Then everybody should have more flexibility. And the technology was now allowing us to do that. And so that's when I really got into it. And, and it has been, you know, obviously a, a, a growing interest and possible more, more and more possibilities of workplace flexibility, but still really hadn't triggered, you know, the changes that were anticipated, you know, until the pandemic, although the future of work, which I've really started being, you know, deeply involved in since 2015, that I was anticipating coming earlier than it did, but it did, it did take a, you know, incredible disruption from the pandemic to get us there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I say, it, it, it just accelerated everything, even though you kind of, it, it seemed to have start and then it kind of seemed to slow down. And then it just kind of, then the pandemic just kind of really kind of gave that some energy. But why, why a book on empathy right now? I mean, you refer to <clears throat> the, the human centric framework to support business. So in the world of high tech and, and AI, why human centric? Well, what I had been seeing actually over, I've been been speaking, presenting, consulting, doing workshops for a number of years, and what had been happening during sort of starting probably in 2017, 2018, is that the three pillars that 
I that my clients were asking for was about changing leadership styles and high performing teams, then the challenges between generations and the sort of miscommunications and misunderstandings. And then the decentralized workforce, more distributed teams, which has you know always been happening. And what came out of my work was that we needed to put ourselves in other people's shoes. If, like if we understood, for example, for me, I'm a Gen X, if I understood really what millennials or Gen Z were going through, then I could better understand how to manage them, how to motivate them. And that was really empathy. And similarly, if you're trying to lead a team, how better to support them and energize them and, and, and motivate them and, and help them understand how they work best by putting yourself in their shoes. And so that was empathy. So it ended up, it was my sort of secret source um, and it was always underlying. And then a couple of my clients who really, you know, asked me to flip it to the headliner. Um, and that's where that started in, I guess, 2018 was when I first started really putting that as a headliner, not for, not for everybody. Mm -hmm. It was more, so it was really about human centric understanding to understand the people you're working with. And the need for that was because technology had sped everything up. So when you're working at a faster pace and work itself, the nature of work has changed insofar as it's not sort of static and linear and easily progress, you know, progressing and you, know, you can predict forecast out for 10 years. Now we're, having, we're working not alone, but in lots of teams, much, on, much more on projects. You know, the project economy has arrived, mm. HBR said. And we're having to keep, you know, keep pivoting and work much more closely together across disciplines. And that's where we need to understand each other more. So the work of the, the nature of what we're doing now and how we're working means we need to understand each other more than we did before. I mean, it could it could have helped before, but now. now yeah, really abso <laughs> absolutely. What I'm curious about, I mean, I, I, I agree. I agree fully what you're saying. One of the things that I observe in the through the work that I do with clients is that um the issue of absolute overwhelm that people are, are suffering from and the apparent inability to prioritize, right? And to really prioritize, which by definition mm. means that you deprioritize other things. Right. I think people are, can be quite good priorities, but the list just keeps like getting longer and mm. longer. And we're having difficulty in saying, in saying no. How do you, how do you address that? In terms of, and how do, where does empathy play a part in actually addressing those issues, or does it? Yes, of course. <laughs> so there are two elements to that. One is the how of work. We have never, for the most part, most companies, most people have never thought, how do I work best? And how could I do this work best? And how would I need to sort it out? And again, when it was linear and you know more static and it didn't change that much, it wasn't nearly as important. Now we're, you know, if you think about how many, obviously the, the pandemic was extreme in the conditions we were dealing with, but that kind of need to pivot and keep changing if we understand workflow, so workflow management software can really help us identify and clarify exactly what's needed when. And when we were all, particularly when we were all in, in one office, we could kind of get away with that lack of clarity because you could always say, oh, John, you know, you know have you done that? What, you know, yeah. When you're working across lots of multiple office locations, you know, when we're working, you know, around the world, but now I have, you know, so many different people living in, uh, working in different locations, then it becomes that much more obvious that we don't really, we haven't clarified the how. And mm -hmm. it's more complicated and it's moving faster. So that's when we, that's where some, a lot of the overwhelm can come from if you don't really know what you're supposed to be doing you don't it's not clear how you how you're going to get it done who you have to be working with where they are all those different things so that's a key piece of it then if you're a manager the how translates into if i if you are on my team and i understand you better if i can tap into and i can read you and so say you know how are things going with you you know uh, is there something going on at home because you don't mm -hmm. see you know you seem a little off today, maybe. Is it to do with a project? Is it to do with something at home or whatever? And I really connect with you. We have a good enough relationship so you feel safe to talk to me. So empathy, again, trust, all those things go into enabling you to feel safe enough to talk to me. Um, and then I can support you better. So those, the, the actual management of the work, the oversight of the work, my being able to support you and coach you are also connected with how I do that and how how well I'm supporting you um, in terms of being able to, the relationship that we have. 
And is that what you mean by leaders shifting from the transactional to the experiential management, or is that is that something different? Because you talk about yeah, that. In the yes, book. absolutely. That's part of it. In terms of it, you know, we have this <laughs> we have this phrase. It's not business. It's not personal. It's business. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so you know, and it is also help back to quote olden times where it was really like your, you know, the handshake. That was it. You know, my, you know, my, 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 you know, my, my word is my bond. We have strayed from the relationships. We've been focusing much more on transactions and have not been uh, focusing as much on the relationships of business, which are what helps us connect, as helps us trust, helps us do business in a very different way. And that's the experience. So it's also, but it's also talking about the customer experience um, and uh, and the employee experience. So I you know, talk in my book about the customer journey, the employee journey, and both of those are important. One, because now technology is allowing us to connect with a customer of one, rather than, you know, blanket, huge 20 million people on a TV ad, you know, you couldn't really, you know, you could give large brand messages, but you, now we, we can focus on, on one person. And therefore I need to understand you. I need to understand what motivates you, why you're going to buy, how could, how to convert you. And then by the same token, if I'm, if I'm treating you with that or, or, or using that human connection to try and understand what's going on and how I can best sell to you and then keep you as a customer we need to have that be consistent through the organization as well and and have the you know people in the organization treated in the same way because they're going to be needing to try and connect with those customers understand whatever whatever role they have in the organization we need to have a consistent culture and a way of treating people um and so that's the way it sort of comes all the way through from from sort of externally mm. all the way through internally and I mean, you, you, you mentioned culture there, because what, what you're really talking about here is a very significant cultural shift in the organization, particularly from a, what might be looked upon as a traditional kind of uh, command and control type. And I know that that is changing and disappearing, but you know, not fully. And, and, and you see kind of remnants of it in organizations. How do you work with organizations to, uh, to really initiate and sustain this change because it's a mindset and a cultural change isn't it it is absolutely a mindset so empathy is is interesting because it is both a a, a value and it's a mindset it's an approach right it's an orientation in terms of how you think about people it's a lot there's a lot to do with inclusion there and openness um and it's a skill so on, on sort of all three levels, it's really important to, to integrate and infuse into to an organization. So in terms of culture, you know, key thing that, that, that I speak about and encourage uh, and help companies to articulate their culture. So it's not a question of kind of like, yeah, no, we have a strong culture, particularly when you have a decentralized or you know, decent um, distributed workforce that it is actually captured in written values and that those values are lived on a daily basis and people really understand it and the leaders are, 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 are exemplifying those particular values so that it's very clear to anybody coming into the organization um, and it's consistent with how people are treated on a daily basis. So it is something that needs to be sort of proactively um, elevated in order, whatever the values may be, um, but to anchor people in particularly when we have times that are changing and challenging and and the overwhelm is is part of there's so much change um as well as burnout about you know trying to get everything done and trying to work out what we're going to be doing next so so those values when they are identified um and articulated and lived that's how to really build a strong culture because then you know everybody's contributing to it on a daily basis yeah. so how do you convince the CEO who's measured on results on a quarterly basis um, by the stock exchange and everything else and by, by, by their board, how do you convince that CEO that this is the right way to do things and this is, the, this is actually going to be better for the business? There are the, so empathy specifically, I, I won't necessarily be mentioning empathy you know, in all of my work, it's a lot about just understanding people. And there are lots of different metrics, which might be, 
you know, in more indirect in terms of employee engagement, which is often measured. And so trust is very connected with employee engagement. Empathy is as well in terms of how people are, are interacting. So if you look at employee engagement, and there are so many leaders now are focused on employee engagement, particularly so they don't want their, their people to leave. So there are lots of different ways, the things that can be measured, that, that businesses can be measuring in order to help people, uh, in order to ensure that they are achieving their, their goals. And so if we think about employee engagement, en engagement uh, helps with reducing retention, uh, with reducing turnover. It also helps with um, uh, you know, productivity. So there are lots of different elements that they can be using to help them con prove uh, or, or sort of show the effect of how focusing on your employees who are the source of the creation of the value of your organization, that that is going to end up. So they do need to get with the program and understand right. and really absorb that particular point because at the core of all of this, that human-centric understanding is really recognizing that each person, each person that's working for the organization could be a non-employee as well, is the one, although they are creating value and they are individual and they need some accommodation as an individual. And that mm. without that mindset, without really taking that on, it's not going to work. Yeah. And you, you talk about retention and obviously retention is a, is a big issue um, mm. right now for, for so many organizations, because, you know, we talk about, you know, the great resignation and, uh, mm. you know, some people say, oh, well, that's just a kind of a, you know, it's, it's not really there. Well, it is, you know, and so for so many organizations, but do, do you see, that great resignation as 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 a problem or as an opportunity to redesign work. Um, I think we have an opportunity to redesign work. I think uh, the great resignation or the great reshuffle or musical chairs that we're playing um, is definitely a a moment to to redesign work as we need to. This has been a long time coming, particularly in the U.S. because people have been working in ways that haven't been sustainable, really, in, ter in terms of having them not burn out, having them, you know, be living lives and, and not sort of stuck in tiny apartments in big cities and being able to live in slightly different ways and, and not be working every single weekend, but just sort of thinking about how can I work best so that I can manage everything. We, we, we've had a lot of societal changes. For example, 66%, close to 70% of of families with kids, both parents are working. Now that wasn't the case when a lot of this sort of traditional way of working mm. was, was established really in the 60s. And you had, because you had one, 67% of families, only one person was working outside the home. So we, we, need, we have needed flexibility um, to, to, uh, for, for what has happened with society. And now we can have some flexibility that allows people to work out their lives better. So the great resignation, for me, that's what it's really about. It's people saying, I can actually see that I can set up my life um, with my family in a different way, that it works better. So it's not necessarily, I don't like this company, but it might means I, I want to, I love this company, but I just don't want to live in this town anymore because mm. I, you know, don't have a garden. I don't, I want to live one of yeah. near my parents or my, my, my wife's or husband's parents. So we can have somebody who looks after the kids. I mean, that's, you know, one situation. Other times it's, you know, it's, People leave bosses, not not companies. And if a boss doesn't really get it and is really not trying to understand that we need to focus on results, um, not presence, um, that they're going to try and move to find another boss, hopefully within the same company. But if not, um, then they're going to be moving to another company because we don't, you know, we have very low unemployment right now in the US. And so that's where they're moving to. They're moving to companies yeah. where they feel they can do their you know, do better work. And overall, if, if you're, if you're sort of aligned to your skills and your strengths and you're working for a boss that you like, you're going to benefit that yeah. organization much more. Yeah. And with, with all the changes going on and, and, and I agree with, I mean, there's obviously been the huge disruption because of COVID and your know, organizations forced into that, that, that remote model. And now companies, as we are, well, we, we're coming out of COVID. I don't even know if that's actually true, but anyway, um, that's a separate conversation. But as we're, as you know, the work, people are coming back to the office and the organizations are kind of rethinking, you saw the Apple doing a kind of a U-turn on what they were asking their, their staff to do. 
have you a view because of your expertise in the future of work where do you see it landing in terms of of this kind of remote going to office where do you see it landing or is there a model or is it just a a, a continuum of models uh every single company is different and i think that's where it needs to be because not only does each company, let's say within a sector, every company in that sector is operates slightly differently. They're in different locations. They set themselves up differently. They use different technologies and they have different people who have different needs and desires and work in different ways. Therefore, every single configuration is going to work slightly differently. And you have, when you have matching manufacturing plants, Obviously, in those types of situations or in healthcare, you have a lot of people who have fixed site jobs. And those people also need some kind of flexibility, which is typically more autonomy in their work schedule, or maybe they can share their jobs and share tasks with other people. So there's more interest that way. There are other things that you can do on, with, with, with fixed sites. So what we need now is we need more out of each employee. We really need people to engage and not just turn up for work and that presenteeism. And in order to do that, it's a really trying to sort of say, and we also have now the technologies to help us do that. I mean, we have these advanced technologies and applications and mobile, you know, very powerful mobile computers. So we can try and configure, as you said before, designing, we can redesign for where we are now. We set up the rules, you know, in the early 1900s and, and obviously in the 1800s as well, for the rules and the technologies we had then. And now we're kind of now it's time to create new rules. It was people like us who made the rules, so we can yeah. make new ones. That's <laughs> the point. It's kind of like, okay, here we are now. And what can we, how do we for this company, how can we best set it up? Mm. And that's the I'm, exciting opportunity, I think. I think it is. I, I I think the other thing is that when you when you look at kind of Gen Z. Who are, who are real kind of disruptors in the workforce, and, and I think in a, in a very in a very positive way. What do you see as their impact on the future of work? I, I'm not sure that they're disruptors. I think just like millennials, they look at the technologies and say, we can, do, we can work differently. So let's do that. And look at this really cool app that I have. And, what, and I, was, I, I was interviewing a, a guy who was, I think, 28, something like that. And he had been, was working with a consulting company during COVID. And, you know, never introduced those teams. It's like, well, hang on a second. I need to help. I want to help people who are working in hybrid models to be able to connect more with their employees. So he set up a company to do that. I mean, this is sort of trying to solve for the challenges of, of how work is evolving. Work has been evolving for centuries, right? Yeah. And so this is just the new thing. And we've needed a bit of a jolt to or shake up in order to, to, to really look at how we can design this better and sort of, as I said, step back first principles and say, how do we do this better? So um, I think Gen Z who have been the first real digital natives, like they've been totally yes. immersed yeah. in this yeah. to understand, to, to, to really look at it. And, and also, I mean, by the same token, they don't have the experience to really know a lot of, you know, a lot of things about what some of the options are so i think it really is a question of everybody working together to contribute their expertise in technology or their experiences um you know in the workplace to combine together and and work out the best way so but but both millennials and and gen gen z's are helpful in imagining some of the possibilities that i know that i uh, that aren't there in my head because I just, you know, technology, I don't have time to mess around with it. I have time to like, you know, what's functional, what's going to help me. Great. Fantastic. Let's do it. Um, but if somebody comes to me and kind of says, Hey, look about what about this? And, you know, experimenting with that. And I go, okay, great. Fantastic. Uh, like, let's talk about it. That's uh, what I think the possibility is now. Yeah. The, the other element in terms of the, the future of work, which I, I find interesting, and I think it's a challenge in, in, in organizations is that, you know the the, the non-linear you know multiple careers over mm. like a longer lifetime and how do we navigate that i mean how do how do individuals navigate in terms of but also how do organizations navigate it in terms of kind of managing developing coaching training developing and you know because you're, you're trying to retain them as well so how do you actually navigate that because it is a little bit of a minefield isn't it Oh yeah, oh it's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, lots of organizations, a lot of people within the organizations 
aren't totally aware of it yet. And that has been certainly an issue for a number of years because that need to help manage people as they come in and they don't, they can't just sort of, you know, get onto a correct track and just sort of sit there and go up the multiple levels. So there are certainly issues with, with flatter organizations that, you know, you're going to have these horizontal di diagonal and pathways as they go. And that complexity, you know, HR is not set up or has not been set up to manage that, particularly in organizations when you have, you know, tens of thousands of people. So there's more HR technology, which is helping with that in terms of managing, in terms of, you know, understanding somebody's competencies and, and being able to map and propose where they might, what they might do next. And obviously that's complicated because within the team, different people want to go in different ways and how do you manage all of that? But there are a lot, there's a lot more, uh, the company like Ant Hill and Sky Hive, they're looking at what people's skills are because it's not about the job anymore. It's really about the skill and what somebody with my skills, what are the possibilities? What, where am I, might I want to go? How does that fit? Um, how can I apply sort of talent mobility, talent mapping and talent mobility and understand the inventory of skills within organizations so that I can work out who in my team can, where they can go next or what they'd be fit for, or what training they might need and what we you know where I'm gonna go next. So there's a lot more complexity to it. There are, there are more solutions in terms of helping companies understand the talent they have and the skills that they have inside their organizations and how they can move them about. Um, but it's come in terms of education, the, there's a, a friend of mine actually works in impact investing and education. They're starting to target people in kids in middle school to help them understand this exact issue, to, wow. to help them understand how they need to be more self-directed about their careers as they're, mm -hmm. because by the time they get to, to, to high school, they're really focused on, you know, dealing with all the high school stuff and in college or, or whatever, you know, whatever skills they're really developing. And education needs a big, uh, upgrade and to be ready for this and it's not there yet but but that's where we need to be focusing on the education in middle school and high school and college helping people understand this exact issue yeah but that's got huge implications in terms of <clears throat> of the educational system in the country isn't it that that you actually you're staffing it with the right people you're training the people to actually do that which is probably quite far away from where they are right now in in general um, so I think it is a big challenge. But you're talking about, you know, the future of work. But I'm just curious, of the, uh, as a result of the work that you do, Sophie, what, what's your concept of, of the future of non-work or retirement? Uh, <laughs> so I think retirement is uh, bad for your health. Um, <laughs> seriously. Uh, you know, we need to have our brains active. We need to be physically active. Uh, what in terms, in, in terms of in my first book at the back, I say, you know, there's all of this going on and there are four things that we need, we also need to address. One is education, two is retirement. Um, and in many organizations, you have a, a sort of 100% or zero. You don't give the possibility, there isn't the possibility for people to phase out. So to step down from being 100% involved to be able to contribute their expertise and stay involved, but also play more golf or also do some travel and you know spend time with grandkids. That's where we need to go. We need to, to be more, and, and that's to do a lot to do with um, contributions to 401ks and stuff like that. Yes. There's some, there some you know, policy issues that need to be changed. And that will allow people to, to stay involved, not be hanging on longer than they you know, might, might, that might be advisable in, in terms of a full-time role, but be able to, to take, you know, a step, some steps down, but, but can keep contributing their extraordinary expertise um, and be, you know, keeping, you know, contributing to their, to, to their retirement savings. Um, so I do think that we have, there are lots of different ways that we can be retiring less <laughs> or, uh, and um, contributing more and that benefits everybody. So you're not you're not a fan of giving the golden watch and the the badge and everything else and that and way you know, that, that job bundle was you work this many years at one yeah. organization and we will you know and with lots of really long hard awful hours doing 
very boring work. Most of course, most of that's been automated away. And then you can actually do something you enjoy doing at the end of that. I mean, you know, it, yeah. it was not a great proposition. You had job security, but the rest of it was not amazing. Okay. Uh, so I think if we can enjoy work more, because we can, the, Pur the Puritan Calvinist idea that we have to suffer at work, we can probably move on from some of that um, and enjoy our work, be, you know, have effective tools and not what if like, if you're working for an organization, you like what you're doing, you're working with people you enjoy, you know, you have good relationships yeah. with. Why, why would you? you? Want yeah. To? Yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying people should keep suffering for long. I'm saying, you know, have some fun and at work and then, we, you know, it's the retirement is not necessarily what you want to do anyway. Absolutely. Sophie, th this has been fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I, I just love what you're saying. And, and it actually it really does kind of fit in with, with my own view of the world. But I just love the way you, you, you present it and, and, and you explain it. Before we tell people how, where to get in touch with you, two questions I ask everybody. One, a book other than your own that's had an impact upon you. What's the book and what was the impact? So Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand. Uh, which I read, I guess, in my late teens. Uh, very powerful story. Um, and it was very, very interesting because one of the key aspects of that is the, the sort of, actually about the purity of money and that it is, it is uh, clean in terms of there aren't hidden agendas. Life is, you know, that much more complicated than that idea. But uh, I think she's a very powerful storyteller. And that was a really, really interesting book for me. Fascinating. <laughs> Haven't read it. Now you've made me curious to go and actually mm. get it. And Fountainhead. Fountainhead's another really good one that she wrote. Oh, Fountainhead. Yes, I have read. That, that is, mm. that is a, a, a brilliant book. Second question is daily rituals. If you have them, happy to share them and what they do for you. <laughs> So this is going to make you laugh. Uh, so I have two dogs and um, I have to get up early in the morning, uh, typically with them to go out. So I have chocolate in the morning. So chocolate and, and coffee with for breakfast. But I, I have take the dogs out for a walk and I have chocolate when I go out. So those that's my ritual. That makes me happy. No matter what the weather is like in New York, I can go out and get up easily um, if I have chocolate. <laughs> Even even in the freezing cold. <laughs> Absolutely in the freezing cold. That would mean need more chocolate, right? <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Sophie, this is great. Where can people get in touch with you? Uh, SophieWade.com um, or my Twitter is a Sophie Wade because uh, my first name is actually Alexandra. Um, SophieWade.com and Flexel Network is my company. Okay, well, we'll put all of that in the show notes where people want to get out there listening. Highly recommend your book, Empathy Works. It's 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 fantastic book. I love the content. I think that there's so much for organizations to learn by by reading and listening to you. So, But I do want to thank you for coming along here today. It's been a real honor to have you. Thank you so much. It's been a delight having this conversation. <laughs> thank you.